piercing the Himalayan sky, a forbidding monolith of rock, snow, and ice. Raw, unyielding, K2, the savage mountain. More deadly than Everest, K2 seduces the best climbers on Earth. Some will reach the summit. Many will die. These are their stories. Suddenly, right in front of me, there was this giant triangular peak rearing up into the sky, and I just froze in place. It's this colossal pyramid that has no weaknesses, that is unrelentingly steep. It puts a magic spell on you, and uh, it just doesn't let you go. For more than a hundred years, K2's magnetic pull has lured explorers, adventurers, and elite climbers. But for decades, the mighty summit rejected them all. Even today, the odds of success are grim. For every three climbers who reach the top, one will die. Today, no less than a century ago, the price for entrance here is passion, grit, and an unwavering will to win. All in the quest for K2. August 18th, 1990. A four-man team struggles upward on K2's treacherous North Spur. Here, above 26,000 feet, there is no room for error. One misstep can spell near certain death. Yet the extreme lack of oxygen robs the men of both judgment and strength. Their most severe test will be the final push for the summit. Though all the men have tried K2 before, none has made it to the top. This is my third time on K2, you know. These other guys were on K2 at the south side in 87, but I'd been on this route before, and there's no other place in the world that's like it. We've got good weather all the way north up into China. As you're going up, you have this fixed pool of, of energy. It's like your bank account, you know. You've got so much money in the bank, and as you're going up, you're making these withdrawals. One of the problems I think a lot of people have on, on these trips is when they get to the top, and they don't have any, any money left in the bank to, to get down before you pull that last penny out of your account. <coughs> <coughs> Most do not make it. More men and women have flown into space than have stood on the top of this mountain. K2 is part of the Karakoram, a mountain range to the northwest of Mount Everest at the border of Pakistan and China. The first known record of K2 dates to 1856. Lieutenant T.G. Montgomery arrived in the Karakoram with a mandate to map the farthest reaches of the British Empire. A mountain range loomed before him, but he was unable to cross the last 130 miles to reach it. He sketched the most prominent peaks as K1 and K2. K1 was later found to have a local name, Masherbro. But for the bigger mountain, the surveyor's stark label, K2, held fast. Word of the discovery sparked interest among explorers worldwide. But the region was so remote and inaccessible, the mountain was often called the third pole. In 1909, Italy's leading explorer, 
the Duke of the Abruzzi, was the first to launch a major assault on K2. Armed with a huge team of men and supplies, he spent months traveling by boat, foot, and horseback, simply to get there. The expedition is quite a big event, regardless of, of the mountain at the other end. And I mean, in order to carry out all the surveying and everything else, I mean, they had to be quite big. Unfortunately, it did become the norm and certainly perpetuated the idea that expeditions were these great quasi-military affairs. The Duke's base camp was the center of operations. From there, he planned to ferry supplies up the mountain to a series of higher camps, and eventually, the summit. He began a careful reconnaissance, looking for a route to the top. The expedition was documented by the world-famous mountain photographer, Vittorio Sella. His dazzling pictures would inspire a generation of climbers who relied on them as guides. Clearly, they were looking for the easiest possible way up. And I think it must have come as a bit of a shock on K2 to find that there wasn't an easy way, and there still isn't. The Duke of the Abruzzi opted for an ascent along a ridge, or spur, that would later bear his name. It looked quite climbable, at least from where he stood. As the Duke of the Abruzzi found out, the nearer you get to the mountain, uh, the more complex and the more broken it is. Very shattered, quite steep. When you get onto it, you're zigzagging around all the time. And it's not, not at all straightforward. The rock's terrible. K2 is a serious mountaineering proposition by any route. Having exhausted what seemed like every possible strategy, the Duke declared K2 would never be climbed. He was taken at his word. And for nearly three decades, not a single attempt was made on K2. In 1938, the American Alpine Club sent a team to K2 to prove the Italian wrong. The group was led by Charlie Houston, a young, experienced climber. He invited his friend Bob Bates to join him. The Alpine Club said, you guys go out and find the route, scout the mountain, and we'll send a really strong expedition next year. In choosing the party, uh, Bob and I deliberately did not choose the best American climbers. We chose people that we thought would get along together, the people that we liked and we thought would be compatible. We knew we had to walk from Kashmir, from the Vale of Kashmir, over the Zoji Lao. We had to go over and, with ponies and porters. Then we had 350 miles to walk along the Indus River. We were traveling through these enormous rocky mountains. Suddenly we go around this corner, up ahead, whammo. It was an absolutely wonderful moment. I think that is the site of the most wonderful mountain vista in the whole world. Here, the huge opening and all these 25,000 foot peaks, and you think there can't be anything better than this. After attempting routes on three sides of the mountain, they returned to the same one chosen by the Italian Duke. They named it the Abruzzi Spur in his honor. Over the next two weeks, the team climbed to 21,500 feet, but were stopped by a solid rock wall more than 160 feet high. The end of the road, they thought, until Bill House spotted a narrow vertical passage it would later bear his name, House's Chimney. Bill House and I led the House Chimney, which was the uh, hardest section. Bill did the leading. He was a top rock climber. 
So they started up a little way, largely without handholds or footholds, but wedging himself in. House's chimney is pushing the envelope, and almost every good climber who's gone to K2 since then has said that House's chimney is right at the fringe of what could be done at any time. It's a, it's a hard climb. The team would later be nicknamed the Cowboys of K2. We were arrogant, we were cocky, but just by keeping going and uh, <laughs> doing things as they came along, we got up to within what we thought was striking distance of the summit. The top of K2, 28,262 feet, was only 2,000 feet above them. The team had already made it 90% of the way. Then a small but vital detail would be their undoing. Matches. They'd run out. Without fire, they could not melt snow for water. And without water, they could die. We had to have water, and we had to have something hot, too. We didn't know about altitude deterioration at that point, but we'd been above 20,000 feet for maybe a week at that point. And I think we were all beginning to feel it. The team turned back, but not in defeat. As far as I'm concerned, we did exactly the right thing. We found the right route. The next team should have no difficulty following our steps, so we'll go home. Nobody got hurt, and we got home safely, having done what we went out to do. Back in the United States, one man scoffed at the idea that any mountain could beat a climber down. Fritz Wiesner was certain he had the ability and tenacity to do what Houston's team had not. Known as a brilliant rock climber, he had a score of successes to his name. But his personality was perhaps as well known as his skill. When Wiesner went to K2 in 1939, a, he was by far and away the strongest climber on the trip, and B, he was an autocrat. Wiesner saw himself as the leader and led from the front, as opposed to Charlie, who was the great Democrat. And Wiesner's idea was that if you're strong enough, you follow me, and if you're not, you fall by the wayside. In the midst of an economic depression, money for the expedition was hard to come by. Wiesner made compromises he would later regret choosing climbers with more wealth than experience. Socialite Dudley Wolf was among them. Dudley Wolf was a playboy in the great Gatsby tradition. He was a big, clumsy, but very wealthy, outdoor type. Wolf was the major funder of the expedition. It's how this guy found himself high on K2. The guy who's forked out the cash for the trip uh, is given the chance to go as high as possible. As the weeks passed, Wolf was desperate to prove himself. He amazed everyone by climbing higher than most of his teammates, beyond 25,000 feet. But it was only with Wiesner's help. Wiesner actually did have quite a lot of time for Dudley Wolf and felt that, you know, because of his enthusiasm and his commitment, he should try and get him as high up the mountain as possible. But he did it in, in what many people would now see as being particularly reckless way. Finally, Wolf grew too weak to go on. He would wait in their nearest camp for the rest of the team, while Wiesner and Sherpa Pasang Lama pushed for the summit. When he got to what's now known as the bottleneck above uh, the, the shoulder of K2, he saw that it was threatened by an enormous uh, band of ice, and he opted for safety and tried to the left by climbing some technically very difficult rock, iced up rock, with a Sherpa who wasn't really equipped to do this. And he'd very nearly done the difficult bit. And the Sherpa came to his senses and said, uh, you know, there are ghosts up there and we're all going to die and refused to pay the rope out. Wiesner wanted to try again, but needed to go down for more equipment. He left Dudley Wolf resting high on the mountain 
and promised to return for another summit attempt. A judgment debated to this day. The strongest member of the expedition, Wiesner, left the weakest, and that was the really fatal mistake, that once Wiesner had gone down, leaving a guy on his own in a tent at just about 8,000 meters, Wolf was probably, probably doomed, even, even at that stage. In 1939, nobody knew that Wolf had been too high far too long. As Wiesner and Pasang Lama descended, they found that each of their camps was deserted. The Sherpas had thought the climbers above were dead. Finally, Wiesner and Pasang reached base camp nearly 24 hours later. Dudley Wolf was alone, more than 8,000 feet above them. But Wiesner, the man who had helped Wolf up the mountain, was far too weakened to get him down. Sherpas mounted a rescue attempt, climbing an astonishing 6,500 feet their first day. Despite their heroic efforts, neither they nor Dudley Wolf were ever seen again. The Savage Mountain had claimed its first four victims. Even today, K2 exacts its deadly toll. The mountain is no less savage, the summit no less remote. You're always conscious that, that this is a dangerous place and others have died around you. It's this very strange thing. You voluntarily go to this very dangerous place and do this very dangerous thing, and you're constantly thinking of other people who've died all around you, yet you're doing it. Whatever else happens, on summit day, climbers must face the mountain alone. Each person has to be much more self-reliant. They have to just accept that suddenly, when you're way above 8,000 metres, you're in a world where there isn't a whole lot that your partners can do for you if you break down. We're preparing for our, our final, hopefully, uh, trip to climbed to the summit of K2. Uh, I was really excited. Tomorrow was our big day, and we were going to have our big day. I think that's one of the really neat things about going off to do these things, too, is how much you rely on just that, uh, on hope, you know, and just that things will be OK and that you'll make it. Not bad. <laughs> hope and a dream have pulled hundreds to this mountain. Sometimes, it's the dream of a nation. In 1954, when Ardito Desio led uh, the big Italian expedition, it was in the wake of the Brits on Everest. In 1953, a British team had put the first two climbers on top of Mount Everest, the world's tallest mountain. An Italian team immediately made plans to claim the second highest peak. Its leader, Ardito Desio, was not a climber, but a geographer who had first seen K2 in 1929 on a scientific expedition. The Italians felt that they, they did have a historical reason for going there. Why nobody did for so long was that, that people just realized it was, it was in a different, different ball game to Everest. Desio organized the expedition with all the seriousness of a military campaign. He knew that while K2 was some 700 feet lower than Everest, it was a much tougher challenge. He brought a strong climbing team and provided them with every possible advantage. Tons of food and equipment were supplied, including bottled oxygen, like the British used on Everest. It took 500 porters to ferry this massive load.
May 31st, 1954, the Italian expedition arrived at base camp. Desio had brought radio equipment, which he used to talk to his climbers as they made their way up the mountain. Often he spoke to them just to offer encouragement, because despite all of his best planning, the savage mountain pounded his team. One climber paid with his life, and for more than two months, others were besieged by illness, injury, and exhaustion. But Desio urged them onward, proclaiming the honor of Italian mountaineering is at stake. In the early morning hours of July 31st, there were just two Italian climbers in position for the summit, Achille Campagnoni and Lino Lacciadelli. When their oxygen ran out, they nearly suffocated, but they refused to turn back. Above them lay a world not meant for humans, a world where only wind and storm had ever brushed the virgin snow. Twelve hours later, the Italian and Pakistani flags waved proudly from the summit of K2. Campagnoni and Lacciadelli filmed the majesty that lay before them, the first views from one of the most remote pieces of real estate on Earth. The pictures came at a price. Campagnoni had removed his gloves to operate the camera. He would lose several fingers to frostbite. The two highest peaks on Earth had finally been summited by the British on Everest and the Italians on K2. The Italian climbers received a hero's welcome as Professor Desio had predicted. He had told them, if you succeed in scaling this peak, the entire world will hail you as champions. In the decades to follow, hundreds more would be drawn to the mountain. Only a handful would reach the top. Even today, with the most modern advances, no one is truly safe on these savage slopes. Woo, baby! The elements are no less fickle or cruel and even the hint of a storm can still spell disaster. The thing is, when you're going for the summit and you wake up to a clear blue sky, your ambition and the nature of your desire to get up there and get to the top and then be done with it is such that you'll probably take the chance and try and outrun the storm, which is certainly how a lot of people have died on K2. You only have a fairly limited window of, of time that you can get from your high camp to the summit and back down. So speed is safety. Started off beautiful weather. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, came a bunch of clouds kind of wrapping around the mountain. We had to have a little discussion about, should we turn around or should we keep going? And we decided to keep going. The men took a huge gamble with their very lives. This time, they won. We did outrun the storm, but we could easily have been completely wrong in our judgment. And an hour after continuing up to the summit ridge, we could have been pinned down by winds and still be there today. They summited K2 and survived. But like all who came before them, they had done more than climb a mountain. 
Ignoring every risk, they pursued a uniquely human quest. I think the fact that genuinely the exploration of the past and most remote points of the Earth, people can still see that that is exploration. But climbing unclimbed chunks of the Earth is in the great tradition of, you know, Marco Polo or Christopher Columbus or whatever. And I think it's some basic bit of human nature that wants to actually see what's around the next corner. And that finds its epitome in climbing. In one sense, K2 has already been discovered and explored. Yet this ever-changing wilderness remains forever a new world. Thus, when the savage mountain calls, the bold will always answer. The quest for K2 has only just begun.